Yeah, so first up, we've got Charlotte Nirim, and she's going to tell us about long cycles, heavy cycles, and cycle decompositions in digraphs. So, all yours. Thanks for the introduction, Alberto, and yeah, welcome to my talk. Um, yeah, everything I'm going to talk about is joint work with Maxim Lasha and Snipeson and Vendus and Vera Snuga, uh, who are with me at ETH. Um, yeah, so let's jump right in. So let's start with the graph setting because I assume this is what people are more familiar with. So if you take a, a normal graph and then you have a Eulerian graph, it's pretty easy to see that you can decompose it into edge disjoint cycles. You can just start walking somewhere and at some point your path is going to intersect itself. There you have a cycle and you just remove the cycle and then you continue to go on. Uh, until you close the next cycle, maybe take this edge next, you find the next cycle, you remove it, and so on. And um, yeah, so you can you can find this decomposition maybe. And Hai is conjectured in the 60s already that we can we can always do this with, with, with very few cycles. And here you can always do it with n minus one over two cycles. And this problem is hard. Why is so? I mean, if you take, for example, this graph and you remove a cycle, maybe you take the one in the middle, you remove it, you're left with the cycle. So you'd only use two cycles. But then if you start in the same graph and your initial size is different, so maybe you choose uh, this red cycle on the left, then you remove it and suddenly you need four more cycles um, to decompose your graph. So, so somehow it's, yeah, greedy, greedy definitely does not work. You have to be, you have to be somehow clever. And one approach is to always take long cycles because yeah, I mean, as I saw in the first example, I took a long cycle and the longer you cycle, the more I just remove the cycle. So, and there's a very uh, old result by Edison Gallet that says you can always find a cycle of length M over N, where throughout this talk, M is always gonna to refer to the number of edges in the graph and N is always gonna be the number of vertices. So this is like order of average degree. And this is obviously best possible if you have something. Um, you can construct cycles that have um, only, only this long of cycles. Okay, so this is a lot of graphs. Um, and yeah, so, so if, you, if you iteratively remove cycles of this length, then you, then you get n, n times log n many cycles. So this is uh, quite far from highest conjecture. This is like what's possible for graphs. Um, and looking at digraphs, so digraphs also have a, a very natural notion of, of Eulerian-ness. Um, so we call a digraph balanced if every vertex has the same number of in and out edges. And it's pretty like intuitive that if a uh, digraph is balanced and connected, it's also a linear, right? You can, you can just start and whenever you arrive at a vertex, you can also leave it again just because you have the same number of in and out edges. And um, some, some old conjecture from Bolivar and Scott says that you can decompose every Eulerian digraph into linearly many cycles. So they're a bit less optimistic than highest. I mean, there's also like some papers on what, I mean, they have in the time where this conjecture appeared, there's a series of papers, like they discuss, okay, what's the constant? But I think it would be really nice to get this to linear, um, yeah, before figuring out the exact constant because it's not n over two like in the, like in the um, direct case. And yeah, people have worked on this before. People looked at mainly long cycles and digraphs because yeah, this edit gallery result for undirected graphs does not transfer to direct graphs in any kind. So one result on long paths in uh, long, long cycles in digraphs was is by Huang Ma Shapiro Zuluk of from 2013. And they show that you can always find cycles of, of, of length of this, this type. And note that this is like asymptotically equal to the edish galley bound if M is either quadratic in the number of vertices or linear in the number of vertices, but it's pretty far off if M is somewhere in between. Yes, so, so this, was, this was the state of the art. But 
Okay, and then you can also use their methods to, to get some decomposition of of our like square root m times m, which is like I mean it's something, but it's 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 very far from from any anything that also like I just like gets you in in undirected graphs. Um, okay, but before I talk more about cycle decompositions, I talk about a seemingly unrelated problem, but we'll then connect all of them in the end. So. Let's talk about heavy cycles in weighted Charlotte, diagrams. Charlotte, sorry, yes. can I ask a question? Is it okay if I interrupt you? Yeah, yeah, sure. So on the on the previous slide, when you were talking about diagrams and this big off and cycles, uh, so the in this case, this Hirsch conjecture is simply not true. Like there are examples that need more than uh, n over two or. Uh, yeah, but this is also because I mean we also have more edges, right? That's one of the mm -hmm. problems. So we don't talk about oriented graphs, we talk about digraphs. So edges can be there in, in both directions. So we also have yeah. more edges. So it's somehow sensible that we need at least n cycles. And then I think there is even a construction that uses slightly more than, that, that needs slightly more than n, like I think okay. five over four times n or so. Um, yes, but... Um, Okay. But linear is is conjectured to be to be definitely possible, and we will not be close enough to this that we can discuss start discussing about the constants anyway. Okay, thanks. Yes, but heavy cycles. So, what is a weighted digraph? Uh, a weighted digraph is just a digraph where every weight uh, where every edge you basically you have a, a weight function. Every edge you give a weight in the positive reals, and then for a subgraph. You can define the weight of the subgraph just to be the sum of the weight of all the edges in the subgraph. And then you can ask, given the weighted, sub, uh, weighted graph G, now we want to find the cycle C that's as heavy as possible, or the weights as large as possible. And this is very connected to the long cycles, just because if you give every edge weight one, then a heavy cycle is just a long cycle. But now maybe you also allow different weights on the cycles, on the edges, and then, yeah, heavy maybe gets a bit of different notation. So this is a generalization of the, of the long cycle problem. And for undirected graphs, um, Bondi and Fenn determined that uh, for two connected graphs, you can always find a cycle of two of the weight of the graph divided by n. And this is, this is best possible. But in diagraphs, actually, you cannot achieve this. So there is. For example, this example of a, you take some path of weight epsilon, and then you ha have all the back edges, and you give them weight one. And this graph has quadratic weight because um, there's linearly many vertices with linearly many back edges. So those create weight, a total weight of, of linear size. But then if you choose your epsilon on the path small enough, in particular, it's like little o of n. Uh, one over n, then every cycle has a constant weight because you can only use one of the edges of weight one. And then the rest of them, you have to use the ones of weight epsilon, but there's n of them only, and then they don't accumulate enough weight to be of any help. So yeah, digraphs, just because you have more restrictions on how you can use the edges seem to be more complicated here. Um, so one idea that is introduced is to have some additional constraints on the weights. And so Bonos and Scott, for example, suggested to, to enforce that every weight needs to have a certain out weight. Where the out weight is just like very similar to the out degree, you sum over all the outgoing edges, and you call this the out weight of a vertex at V. So for example, in, in this uh, graph above, one of the problems is that V1 has outweight on the epsilon, right? It only has one outgoing edge, and that has weight epsilon and no incoming edge. So in particular, if we walk into this vertex, we have to take this, this other edge because we don't have any other chances. But what well, about some stuff that if this, this does not happen, so if there's no vertices that are really bad to get stuck in, then we can always get cycles of weight I mean, so not that if, if, if every vertex has at least weight one, then the weight of the graph is at least linear. So this two over log n is, is 
still not not the optimal thing that you can reach in in non-directed graphs, but it's only a log factor away. And so this was proven by Li and Sang, I think after a factor of two in 2012. But Balashi Scott also provided an upper bound. So they also give you give a graph of weight uh, where every vertex has outweighed at least one that achieves uh, that has no cycle heavier than log log n over log n. In particular, that shows that we cannot hope to get a result of, of constant here. So, I mean, the natural thing for, for directed graphs, this would say that there is always a, a cycle of constant weight, but this example shows that this is actually not possible. And I mean, sadly, the, the graph is too complicated to put on the slide, but it's basically some tree-like construction um, that also has a lot of back edges. Is there a reason why this two over log n? Like, what can you briefly explain why that is sort of natural, or is there not? I'm there? actually not so sure why they conjectured this. I think they had something that went into the direction. I think this is like they had half of similar weight, and then this was something they thought was reasonable. So, but we we actually show that this uh, upper bound is tight. So we, we can show that you can always find log, log log n over log n. So I'm not really sure where this conjecture of two over log n ever came from. OK, thanks. Um, OK, so the first thing I want to talk about is how heavy cycles relate to cycle decompositions. And for this, we're going to introduce, I'm going to introduce a weight function that we call the uniform weight function. And this is just. For every edge going from u to v, we give it the weight of one over the out degree of u. And in particular, that means that, I mean, in the, in the previous slide, I had this condition of the out weights summing to one. And this uniform weighting has the nice property that it always, the out weight of every vertex is at exactly one, just because the weight function is defined such that this is exactly true, right? Every vertex has like, some number of out edges, and then you give every of the edges the weight one over this number. So they always sum to one. Let's see an example for this. So for example, take this graph, and I'm going to define the unit, I want to see the uniform weight function, and then this is what we get. So for example, this vertex here has only one out edge, so its, it's out edge gets weight one, but for example, this vertex here has three out edges, this one, this one, and this one. So each of them gets weight one over three. Okay, so this is our weight function that we define. And then one of our main results is that if you get some balanced digraph and you take these uh, values psi and mu, we think of psi as some small constant and mu is going to be something like uh, like n log uh, like like log n log n so um, yeah this is the mu is not going to be a constant but this does not really matter for now and then if you for every for every set graph of your graph g with minimum degree mu you can guarantee that you can find a cycle where the sum of the inverse degrees is at least psi then we can guarantee you to get a cycle to decomposition with with like n times mu plus uh, this constant that depends on the cycle weight, n times log average degree, and some linear error term. And note that this maybe scary looking uh, sum of the inverse degrees is just the weight of the cycle in the uniform weight function that I defined before. And this is exactly how we're going to connect those. So let's see an example. So, for example, if this is my, my subgraph G prime, then yeah, here I can maybe find a, a vertex of low degree. In particular, this one has degree one. So this minimum degree condition is not fulfilled. But if I pretend that there are some more edges, then I'm guaranteed to find to find some, some long cycle. And if this is fulfilled, then I can find the cycle decomposition. And the proof is very nice and natural, so I'm going to show you some bits and pieces of that. So, Charlotte, first, sorry, yes. sorry. Uh, so, can you comment on how this relate, or maybe you'll do it later, but then tell me uh, how this relates to, say, this Huang and others' uh, result um, for uh, 
like so how they find long cycles no 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 how does this like the uh, like um it's there are quite a few parameters and it's it's difficult to see immediately how this relates to the previous yeah, yeah. i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna no all of the comparisons are gonna come later yeah, yeah this is okay so after the proof okay cool. yeah yeah i mean also Oops. we're gonna this is not gonna find you i mean this also like the number of cycles still depends on how i how i go into my parameters right so yeah 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 definitely. this is so no, 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 let's just just go through this proof first and okay. then um, sure, sure. you get some more information so one observation is that, yeah, when you take some balanced graph or some balanced digraph and remove a cycle, the resulting graph is again balanced. And that's very obvious, right? Because you remove one image and one out as all the vertices that the cycle touches um, and nothing at the others. So you, you are guaranteed to keep the balanceness condition. And what we're going to do is we're just going to iteratively remove cycles so now think about this. I mean, in the on the very first slide, I told you about this edish Galai result on how you can iteratively remove long cycles, and this is basically what inspires what inspires this idea. But because we cannot find long cycles, we will we will find heavy cycles, and then use this weight that we defined to to then limit the number of cycles that we remove. And what we're going to do is we're always going to update the weights. What does that mean? Like, for example, we take this graph here, we take the red cycle, we remove it, and then we have to, for example, this vertex here, previously had two out neighbors, out edges, that's why all the edges had weight one over two, but now I removed one of them, so I have to update the weight of the other one. And this basically ensures that we always keep this condition that every vertex has outweighed at least one, and yes, so we all update the weights of the edges. And one observation that I also want to make is that every non-isolated vertex is in at least one cycle at any point. And that's just follows because I mean we have this our graph is balanced at any point. So every connected component is Eulerian, and then it's very easy to see that you just have every cycle, every vertex to be in a cycle. So like when we do with this removal. The main observation is that at every step, one of the following two things holds. Like either you get a graph where there is a vertex of degree at most mu, we call this a low degree vertex. And then we just remove any cycle containing this vertex. And we will, we will really just, I mean, previously I told you there is one and you just take any cycle that contains this vertex. And if, if this is not true, then the premises of the lemma tells you that there is a cycle of weight at least psi, and then you remove this cycle. And the one of the important observations is that the first thing can only happen mu times n times. Why is that? I mean, whenever you do this, you remove a cycle that goes through a low degree vertex, so you remove an edge at that vertex. Or you move an out edge, and this can happen at most mu terms n times per vertex because yeah, the vertex can only be low degree if it has degree at most mu. Then you, for every time it is the low degree vertex, you remove a cycle, so its out degree gets decreased by one. So it can only be the low degree vertex at most mu times. So in total, this happens at most mu terms n times, and we just set those cycles um, apart, and then we look at the cycles that we get from the second step. And they're a little bit, little bit more difficult to count um, because there's some double counting involved. And here we're gonna count over the weight. So we know that the total weight of the cycles that we removed in this step is psi times the number of cycles, just because we know that every cycle has weight at least psi. But then we also know that if we, if we look at the contribution of a single vertex, because we update the weights, we know that it can only contribute the harmonic sum up to its degree, right? Because every edge, in the beginning, it has weight one over the out degree, and then one edge gets removed, its weight gets updated to one over the out degree minus one, and so on until it reaches one. And each of these numbers can appear at most once in the, in the second step. I mean, not all of them need to appear because some of them can, can be removed for cycles of the, of the first step, 
But if I if I take the somatic sum up to the degree, I definitely have an upper bound of the way that a single vertex contributes to all of the cycles. Yeah, and then I just can can just use that I can upper bound this by by some logarithm, and then I get that the total contribution of this is at most um, yeah the total weight is at most something, and then I know that every cycle has some certain weight, so I get a an upper bound of the number of cycles that I used in this step. Yes, and then I just uh, combine this. So this is the cycles I removed in the first step. This is the cycles I removed in the second step. So, um, yes. So, but now somehow I cheated you, right? I told you, like, given that you can find heavy cycles, you can, you can do the decomposition step, but I have not even told you how to find heavy cycles yet. Um, so how do we find heavy cycles? So this is how we find heavy cycles. So um, we take some constants, k and psi, and then we can tell you that every gra graph, digraph on n vertices with some minimum degree k times log m, and this is going to be the mu in the previous step, um, because this is the degree we need to for this lemma to work. And as soon as we have this, we can find the vertex uh, cycle with weight um, exactly what we want. And this is the only thing that we need in order to fix the, the previous, I mean, to, to extend the previous then a, to a real proof of, of finding a cycle decomposition because it, it, it heavily uses this lemma. Um, okay, I also want to give you just some ideas on how we prove this because I think it's really nice. So we use randomness here. So we create some, the cycle using some modified random walk. We start at some arbitrary vertex uh, at zero, and then we keep walking. And at any point, as long as the vertex we're currently in has more neighbors that are not visited yet, then it has visited neighbors, which is one of the unvisited neighbors uniformly around. And if, if we have too many neighbors seen already and very few unvisited neighbors, then we just close the cycle to the earliest neighbor on the path. So let's see some example of this. So we start walking somewhere and maybe it's step x t. We're here, we have one neighbor on the path and four unvisited neighbors. So we just choose a uniform random neighbor from here. Maybe we choose this one, we go here. And maybe at some other point in time, we encounter a vertex that has only two unvisited neighbors, but like already three on the path. And then we say, okay, I mean, we could continue, but we, we decide not to. Um, we just say, okay, now it's time to close the cycle and we close the cycle as, as large as possible. But we will always use this vertex. Now we just throw the first part away. We, I mean, we cannot guarantee that we, that we really close the first vertex, but this is, not, this is not the problem. So why does this work? Like, I mean, the, the algorithm itself is, is really simple, right? I mean, um, yeah, coming, coming up with that is not so difficult, but the problem is like, now we actually have to guarantee that the cycle we find with this is, is heavy enough. And why is that? Um, the idea is like, why is it nicer to look for heavy cycles than it is to look for long cycles? The problem is when you look for long cycles, when you encounter a vertex of very low degree, you're basically screwed because it gives you really little options. But if you look for a heavy cycle, and we have this uniform weighting, encountering a vertex of low degree is really nice because the vertex itself is going to contribute a heavy edge that's already enough to, to basically pr uh, provide the weight that you want. So either the cycle is, you get is long or it contains this low degree vertex, which is super nice for you because it basically contributes all the weight that you want itself. And I mean, the problem is that, of course, I mean, there is some threshold and then there's low and I mean I, I mean obviously like degree constant is really nice but then you have to be careful with vertices in between but we use some Chernoff type concentration to basically um, guarantee that for every vertex at every time uh, the proportion of its visited neighbors does not get too high um, because and this this we can do because yeah we we Close, we close cycles 
um, as soon as we reach a village where half of the villages are not visited, but because we always choose uniformly at random the neighbors, um, we will we will not like spot like hurt the vertex too badly before we encounter it itself uh, an expectation. And then yes, so somehow now we can we can, this basically gives us some guarantees on the um, yeah on the degrees and and how how this some how this intersection behaves. Um, before we close, and then we can we can show that once we close, I mean also yeah basically this 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 um, because we want to have that I mean our, the, the sum that we want to have in the end has this one over one over out degree of of, of x t for for all the vertices, and then yeah this is how we how we how we get it in using using this expectation. And, that is always behaving nicely during during all the steps, and this finishes the proof. Um, yeah, and then you can easily combine it with the previous uh, the, the the cycle decomposition lemma to, to to find a decomposition into n log n cycles, and we can improve this to n log delta by de-randomizing the second lemma. Um, the proof does not get nicer, it gets much longer. So actually in the paper, we include both, both versions, versions because I think the, the randomized version is, is really nice for the intuition. And yeah, the de-randomized version basically just, instead of choosing a random neighbor, has some function that it evaluates and optimizes for. Um, yeah, this is quite technical, so I don't want to talk about this here at all. Um, but what I want to highlight is that all our proofs are algorithmic. So we can actually efficiently find those cycles, which I think is, is cool because, yeah, we all know that finding long paths and cycles is usually hard. Um, I mean, obviously, we cannot guarantee that this is the longest, so we um, we don't break any any anything. But um, yeah, we can we can find our cycles efficiently, not only for existence. And what we can also do. So now I told you about heavy cycles, but I also restricted the weight functions to this uniform weighting, right? But the Bolabash Scott um, conjecture I mentioned in the beginning, I mean, obviously does not restrict to this weighting. It just says that the sum of the weights has to be one at every vertex. Um, but very similar to the de-randomized version of this lemma, we can also have a version that works for the non-uniform case by introducing a second. So here we have a function that optimizes for the degrees. And then here, basically, instead of only closing when we have too much of the degrees, that we also have to keep track of how much of the, how much, like, fra the fraction of the outweight that we have used up. And then we also have to make sure that we have not used up too much outweight for any vertex. But if we then, like, optimize for both of the parameters, then yeah, we consider the outgoing weight. Um, yeah, then if we if we optimize for both parameters, then we can we can like, get rid of this non-uniform weightings and do this for, for general weight functions as well. So here's the table, and I probably just look at the rating for. Um, so for cycle decompositions, like the best known method about before was this squared n times n. This was from the Hangma Shapiro of Newster paper, and obviously, I mean, yeah, you also you always need linear and cycles. Um, yeah, and we get this n log delta, which is yeah, obviously much closer to this to this linear um, bound than um, than the prefer, and also for the, I mean, this. It's not like the highest conjecture is solved for for, for undirected graphs, right? I think for undirected graphs, you can you can beat this log n. I think you can do you can do n log log n, but yeah, this is a hard problem even in graphs. But but we get we get really close for die graphs as well. And yeah, for for long cycles, obviously, yeah, you cannot beat you cannot beat Edge guy. Which is which is the the upper bound in other also the, I mean this is the best bound in, in undirected graphs. There is this lower bound 
from Hong Mas appear. So there was new star, which yeah, which was optimal in on the on the border cases of M being very large or very small, but not so good in between. And I mean, so how do I mean I did not talk about how we find long cycles because we basically don't. We say take the decomposition and then we say, okay, I took my M edges, I decomposed in the N log delta cycles. So one of them has to have at least M over N log delta edges. So this is how we get um how we get this bound. But it yeah, it it actually it's quite competitive to, to the best non lab answer. So, so we we actually get some quite some improvement. And yeah, so for the heavy cycles, Olibash and Scott conjectured this log log n over log n. Um, or oh, that's the upper bound they gave. Lee, uh, Lee and Sang has the, had this one log log n, which comes from the uh, Balaskat conjecture. And we actually prove log log delta over log delta. I mean, but note that like the Balaskat conjecture construction has, I mean, high max degrees. So this is not contradicting this, but yeah, we, we just, this is just, what, what our methods give. Um, yes. So, um, yeah, I guess if someone wants to ask questions about this in general, then now is a good time. So, here, can you uh, get uh, a similar construction as in? Uh, to 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 make sure that it's theta and not just omega of log log delta over log delta, like for or for the upper bound. Make that, the, yeah, does it, does it make sense? So like modify or extend Bolo Bash and Scott's construction, I mean, or or you can take just disjoint. I mean, well, I guess. Just yeah, disjoint. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think this is this is this is the way to go. Okay, um, this is trivial. Okay. Yes, so then, so this this is what we did like basically uh, one and a half years ago, but there's some recent addition that I wanna add in this talk. So one thing we recently did was what about paths? So uh, very recently, Jan Salzadek of um published a paper on Eulerian diagraphs um, with long paths, and I showed that every Eulerian diagraph has a path of length. Um, average degree to the like one half plus 40, one over 40. And this, so for a long time beforehand, this this square root of average degree was was the best known known. And they they pushed this a bit a little bit further. Um, and note that our methods, I mean obviously you can also apply the previous bounds for paths, but this um, you always keep this log delta and if the average degree is very far from the max degree, then, then you actually get, get like this, this bound beats you. But we can improve our methods. So for paths, we managed to improve our methods from this average degree over log delta, what the previous um, results gave us, to um, average degree over log average degree. And so if you paid really close attention, then you notice that so this, this log delta, it does not come from the decomposition step. It only comes from the cycle finding step. The, de the decomposition step in this paper will basically stay the same um, because there we have this log, log average degree anyway. But then the, the log delta comes, comes from the fact that we need this, this log delta average degree, uh, min degree for finding the cycles. Yes. Um, but for paths, yeah, we use the same decomposition, but obviously we have to be a bit more careful because now we don't remove cycles. And then it's not true that if I have a balanced digraph and I remove a path, that it stays balanced, right? I will always have two vertices that I, where I will destroy the balanceness. But then this is, not, this is not a problem because we are actually able to control one of the endpoints of our path. So we just start with removing one path. And then we can, I mean, we can control the, the, the vertex where the path ends in, and we can just, yeah, take the graph, which has one more in edge and it has out edge, the vertex that has one more in edge and it has out edges, and then we will find the heavy path that ends in this vertex. 
yeah, and we can go on with this until eventually either we remove everything or we basically end up in the, we have a closed walk and we end up in the vertex that is balanced a different way. But in particular, this means at any point for decomposition, our graph will be almost balanced in a way that there is going to be every vertex is going to be in degree equal to out degree, except for at most two vertices that can be balanced and imbalanced by exactly one inch. And yeah, why is, why is paths, like where can we do this improvement for paths? I think the main point is that finding paths is actually significantly easier than cycles. So in particular, the methods we use for path finding is quite different from the, from the cycle finding method in the sense that we use some DFS based approach um, to find this heavy path. And yeah, because this, I mean, this does not need the minimum degree. We basically, we need, I mean, in the randomness, we need the minimum degree of log n to get concentration on this, on this value that I had. And then also in the in the de-randomized version, there's a very similar argument that needs basically this is basically also the concentration which needs this this log delta, this log max degree. But yeah, this this very different um, approach for paths basically does not need any min degree at all. So we get we get rid of this min degree condition basically totally, but then yeah, we still get this log average degree from the from the decomposition step just because we remove them one by one. Um, yes, so this this stays, but yeah, we can we can get this this down to d log d, and this actually yeah that is is really strictly better than than the bound from Janssen to the control one for for all bodies of, of delta. So we can get rid of this delta like max degree dependency here. But of course, I also um, brought some next steps for you to work on or for some inspiration if someone feels inspired by this talk. Um, yeah, so of course, I mean, the biggest step is like to close this gap uh, for cycle decomposition. So long cycles, like can we, can we like get the sample linear in any cycles or can we show that we always find a path, a cycle of length um, m over like order m over n. Also, the heavy cycles. Um, yeah, I mean, we we still need this this um, this outweight at least one. But going to the original paper from Robert and Scott, they propose a lot of different variants of this. In particular, so if the, if the graph is Eulerian, actually, this this condition should not be needed. This outweight at least one. This should not be needed. Um, and also, they have. They have a different um, approach where they instead of having having Eulerian graphs, you can also have like the in weight to be equal to the out weight for all vertices. And then they also can um, conjecture that you can you can find um, heavy paths. Uh, yeah. So though this is some some yeah some some directions that are still need to be explored. But especially for like closing this gap, I mean, I think it's pretty hard. And in particular, yeah, our methods, our methods seem to reach some kind of natural boundary here because this, like this removing cycles one by one seems to give this very natural lock factor that I personally don't really see how to, how to get rid of like using, using our methods anyhow. Okay, then I thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Charlotte. And uh, I propose that everyone amuse themselves and we can clap. I think we have some time for maybe one or two quick questions, if there are any. Well, I would say one, then two, but. <laughs> So when you are finding the paths, you're you're saying that you control the endpoints, but do you, do you control the direction as well? Or I mean, you you control the 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 vertex uh, the path the vertex the path ends in. Okay. So you have no control over the starting vertex, but you can say that you find a heavy path that ends in this particular vertex. 
And then, yeah, I mean, this basically means we control the direction, but not both vertices, but only one vertex. Yeah. And then this is enough because then you will balance this vertex and unbalance another vertex, but then you again have only two imbalanced vertices. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if not, I think we can move on to the next speaker. So thanks again, Charlotte.